Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Saturday morning and taking some time out of your busy weekend to join us for what we think will be an incredibly useful webinar from Rotary Great Britain and Ireland. My name is Phil Dyer and I am the Rotary Public Image Coordinator for Rotary Great Britain and Ireland. I also sit on the newly formed Rotary Great Britain and Ireland board as a general board member. Uh, but I'm delighted that I'm joined today by two experts. Uh, later on in the show today, we will be joined by a um, pre-recorded video from James Bolton, who is the communications manager at Rotary Great Britain and Ireland in Ulster. Uh, but as you can see on the screen uh, next to me, we've got Dave King. And Dave is the managing editor of the Rotary Great Britain and Ireland uh, magazine. He is an expert. He is a journalist. He is a lecturer of and programme lead at um, in multimedia sports journalism at UCFB. Um, today is a webinar, so you will not be able to uh, communicate in the chat function, but you will be able to ask some questions in the question and answer box. And we urge you to do that uh, because we are leaving plenty of time for questions during the latter part of this webinar. Uh, so uh, that's it for me during uh, the initial stages of this webinar. You may see me a little bit later on. I'm going to hand over to Dave King now, who's going to talk to you about all things copyright. Thank you. Over to you, Dave. Thanks, Phil. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's copyright webinar. We had close to 700 people register for the webinar this morning, which is quite phenomenal in terms of numbers. Um, copyright is perhaps not the most thrilling and absorbing of subject matters on a Saturday morning, but I guess it, it beats Christmas shopping, doesn't it? 43 days to go till Christmas, by the way. But I reckon that this will be one of the sort of most important Rotary webinars that you will attend this year. Why? Well, if you don't follow carefully, then copyright could cost you and your club hundreds of thousands, hundreds of pounds. So as I used to say in our hello, hello, listen very carefully. I will say this only once. So um, this is me. You'll uh, have seen my ugly mug gracing the tabard loving Rotary magazine as its honorary editor. I've, um, yes, and I've been working on the pages this morning uh, and the December issue, the letters pages, is, is an interesting read, but uh, moving on swiftly. As Phil has currently introduced, um, I've been an ed editor for 40 years. I should point out that I'm not a member of Rotary GBNI staff, but I am a, a volunteer Rotarian like all yourselves, and I'm a member of Gosport Rotary in Hampshire. But more importantly, I am a specialist in media law teach law at the, London, at the London University where I am the head of journalism. I should also say before I start, I reckon I'm going to chat for around 35 minutes. And as Phil said, we'll then take some questions. Thank you to those who sent questions in advance. Um, just to say, um, if you wish, take notes during the presentations, grab screenshots of the slides from your laptop or tablet if you wish. Um, you have my permission, by the way, there's no copyright breach there. Um, and then following the presentation today, we're going to pull together some frequently asked questions of copyright to be made available to all Rotarians in Great Britain and Ireland, alongside a copyright guide, which I first wrote some three or four years ago. So we'll make that all available to you. And there will also be a recording of this uh, available on YouTube. Phil can correct me later if I'm wrong on that. So. I've been sort of working with Rotary GB and I advising on copyright for a number of years, and you may well have attended uh, some webinars, uh, some copyright web webinars previously. And to be fair, when we first did those webinars four or five years ago, copyright was important, but it wasn't such a big issue. Certainly going back 20 years and beyond, I had fairly infrequent brushes with copyright breaches as a newspaper editor occasionally a picture would be published in one of my titles and a disgruntled photographer would write a letter 
remember those letters with a stamp and an envelope? Anyway, occasionally I would get a snotty letter written by a photographer complaining that we published their photograph in the newspaper without their permission and he'd like £50 compensation. So we paid up, we sent him a post, Lord of Greenshield stamps or whatever. But in truth, 20 years ago, before the digital revolution we have now, unless the photographer had actually read the paper or was told about it by a friend, they would honestly be none the wiser. And in reality, to be fair, most photographers were thrilled to see their, their photographs being pictured in, being published in the paper. And all the artists said, could you put our name or byline in the photograph the next time you used it? Um, so again, that's how things used to be in, in days of old before we had all this internet. But that was the days before digital. That was the days before 2000 BD. Now with the World Wide Web, with social media and artificial intelligence, copyright has taken a really dangerous threat with promises to get worse. We live in this world of digital media, of websites, social media, and where everyone is a publisher and everyone has a voice. And as a result, copyright has become this growing problem, not just for Rotary, but for organizations everywhere as producers of these images use sophisticated bots, I'll talk about that more later, to trawl the World Wide Web and pick out anyone who has breached copyright. So with this webinar, um, we've got a fair bit of ground to cover because I, I want to leave time for questions. And I'm, as I say, I'm grateful to many of those who've given the questions in advance. So what I'll be doing is explaining the copyright law and its application, giving examples of how copyright works and finish off by offering you as Rotarians um, ideas of how you should, con you should conduct yourself within your clubs and districts to ensure you don't fall foul of copyright law. And as, um, as has been previewed by Phil, James Bolton will come on afterwards and he'll give another few practical uh, solutions to help you with the copyright. So let's talk about copyright now where we're at. Rotary has unfortunately found itself caught up in a number of legal battles in recent years regarding breaches of copyright by clubs. In one particular case, a Scottish Rotary club innocently published a picture on their website of a TV camera, which they downloaded off the internet. The photograph was used to illustrate a job talk by one of its members. It wasn't exactly picture of the year, but it was someone else's picture and it still breached, breached someone else's copyright. So this image was tracked down by a German photographic agency who demanded a fee in compensation. Now, this was a quite a high fee and it was eventually negotiated down by Rotary GBI's lawyers to 500 euros but with an agreement that the images would be taken off the club's website and the club would desist from further breaches. What the Rotary Club failed to do was to take down the image. Sorry, they took down the image, but what they failed to do was to take the image off the archive. And the image, that image on their archive in their library was soon discovered by one of the bots doing their spring cleaning of the web. So when the German lawyers returned a few months later, they now demanded 5,000 euros, which was negotiated down, but the Rotary Club had to pay. And the liability, I'm afraid, rests with the clubs. I've seen one question come up about, you know, does Rotary GB and I get involved? Does it pay um, the fines? No, they don't. The liability rests with the clubs. It does not rest with Rotary GBNI. It does not rest with Rotary International. So here's just some outlines of what we're talking about. This year, Rotary GBNI has had to deal with about half a dozen cases where Rotary clubs have been contacted by photo agencies for breaches of copyright 
in a similar vein to the Scottish example. The clubs have contacted the Rotary team at Ulster for advice um, and guidance about how to settle. However, in a second and more sinister turn of events this summer, we've now had a case where a Rotary club was picked up for a breach of copyright for something it posted not on its web page, but on its Facebook page. So what happened was that a charity well known to many Rotarians had posted on its Facebook page a story about its work it was doing in Ukraine to support refugees. To accompany that social media post, the charity took an image from the CNN news website of the devastation in Ukraine and posted it with their original story. Now, the irony is that the charity which made the original post has not been picked up for the breach, hence why I'm being very coy about identifying them. They know who they are because I've told them off for being such Muppets. However, it was the Rotary Club, not the charity, which got done for copyright because it shared the charity's post on its Facebook page in good faith. Three months later, that breach was picked up and they received an email. This is the Rotary Club. They received an email highlighting the breach and demanding £500 for the cost of that image. It is so random. Now, I intervened. I tried to head off the company, but only succeeded in reducing the amount of that damages to £100, arguing what's known as good faith publication. So as you can gather, copyright has become a hot potato for Rotary. And I fear, along with the Rotary team at Ulster, unless we are very careful, we could be set for a deluge of these copyright breaches. Hence why we're having this webinar today. Pickwrights, as you can see there, is one image, sorry, is one agency which Rotary has had dealings with. What um, and Getty Images, by the way, is another image. Now, what Pick Rights is doing is not illegal, though perhaps the manner in which they do it leaves perhaps uh, 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 and an, it doesn't necessarily leave a, an, leave a nice taste. There are other agencies that do this too. I mentioned Getty Images, who've been sending letters out to small businesses and and the like, demanding money for images which they say is theirs, and that is the root of the problem. The background is this, that the internet, as we all know, is a treasure trove of information and imagery, but Rotarians are finding out to their cost that assuming those images and that material is free and then publishing it on their club website or even social media can be expensive. Many photographers and large um, archives are now using this artificial intelligence to protect their copyright. Some picture agencies such are uh, using bots such as PicScout. It's a clever piece of software which trawls the web looking for unauthorized use of imagery and when they find a case they generate an invoice and using these technical means to detect copyright it is on the increase. For example there is one publishing house photog for photographers called Pixie.com which promises photographers that they will ensure no one breaches their copyright. It's a money-making exercise. In other instances, such as the, the case of the Rotary Club, which was nailed because of posting the Ukrainian Facebook picture, there are now these third-party organizations, such as Pick Rights, who are acting on behalf of the, of the photo agencies, who are then vigorously tracking down breaches, even among individuals. So that's the warning, loud and clear. You, your club, and your district need to be squeaky clean with all the content you publish on your website. Of course, the elephant in the room is that now there are these bots trawling the World Wide Web, like something out of a George Orwell novel, looking to, to, to detect copyright breaches. One wonders where they will go next. But that's why we need to clean up our act. And that's why we've got this webinar this morning. Now, 
you might think that all this is really underhand by the photographers and cries of how dare they? Is this the latest PPI scandal? Well, not at all. Clearly, photographers are using, using these digital tools vigorously to ensure their copyright is not abused. But what they're doing, and this is the key point, what they are doing is within the law. So if you are in the unfortunate position of receiving a letter from one of these agencies demanding payment, it's not a hoax. It's not a good idea to bury your head in the sand because if you do, these companies, particularly with their large banks of lawyers, they will pursue you not only for the, the copyright damages, but eventually, if you just try to hold off, they'll do you for costs as well. And you can argue until the cows come home about the morality of it. And why are they chasing charities and individuals? But to the photo agencies and to the photographers, you have broken the law. Because copyright is all about protecting intellectual property, work which has been originally created and is of value. For freelance photographers, protecting their rights in an image is very important to their livelihood. If a photograph is copied online without permission or payment, it can dramatically, it can drastically affect their income. Now, I don't know if you are watching the, the new series, Series 5 of The Crown on Netflix, which was out this week featuring the Queen's Annas Horribilis, along with the marital tribulations of Charles and Diana. But do you remember, perhaps in the distant past, 1997, there was an image which appeared on the front page of the Sunday Mirror. And it was a picture of Diana, Princess of Wales, kissing Dodi Al Fayed on his father's yacht in the Mediterranean. Now, I'd love to show it to you, but for fear of breaching copyright with this presentation, I den. The reason I mention this is that that image appeared in the Sunday Mirror on August the 10th. 1997, three weeks before Diana's death. The Sunday Mirror bought this one grainy photograph for two million pounds. And with syndication, this photograph made 10 million worldwide. So copyright is all about protecting value. <clears throat> so let's talk about the law. And I promise you, this is straightforward. I'm not going to bore you with this. But the law we're talking about is the Copyright Designs and Patents Act of 1988. Now, I spent the first part of this presentation talking solely about images, because that is the area most under threat through the digital revolution. However, copyright also applies to other areas of artistic work, such as literature, music and graphics. And once again, as I said earlier, this branch of the law is known as intellectual property and gives those who create anything from a, a magazine article to a novel, a piece of music, a photograph, the power to protect their work from being copied and used by other people. And now the law states that others cannot copy or use original material which you have created as if it was your own work without your permission. Copyright, after all, is about deterring and punishing plagiarism. And here we see it, of what section one of the act says when it breaks copyright right down into three distinct areas. There is, by the way, no copyright on news, facts, ideas, or information, but there is copyright on the way that it is selected, arranged, and presented to create an original work. In terms of copyright, copyright lasts for a long time, even longer than Cliff Richard. A photographer, a photographer, for example, owns copyright throughout their life, and it then passes on to their heirs for another 70 years. Yeah, almost as long as Cliff Richard. Material only moves into the, to the public domain and becomes free to use at the end of that 70 year period. So it's safe to assume, unless you're going way back into something into Victorian and 19th century photography, that it will be copyrighted. So I just wanted to 
use the next few slides to give you some examples of what is copyright protected so that it gives you a wider understanding of the law and its application. With literary, dramatic, musical and, art and artistic works, whoops, sorry, I jumped a bit too prematurely there. With liter lit literary, dramatic, musical and artistic works, the key requirement here is that the work has to be original. It doesn't mean that it has to be strikingly imaginative, as you can see from this newsletter, which I produce from my Rotary Club. It's just that this is my original work. And in principle, you shouldn't copy it in full without my permission. Although in truth, and I think we've got a question coming up about this uh, in the Q&A later, you are free to use any material produced within the Rotary family without fear of copyright, so long as you're sure of the source, to make sure that they, you know, if, if they've breached copyright, you don't want to breach it too. Uh, and so long as you credit the source too. So as good practice, it's always wise if you're going to take material, rotary material, just check its provenance and maybe check with the authors and the originators first. Broadly speaking, when we talk about literary, we're talking about journalistic articles, poems, books, lyrics, plays, scripts, music manuscripts, graphic works, maps, plans, sketches, paintings, sculptures, database, and computer programs. For example, did you know that TV listings are copyright protected? Media, organiza media organizations pay thousands of pounds every year for the privilege of providing daily television listings in their pages and on the internet. And there's a case that goes back to 1984 when Time Out was sued by independent television publications for republishing listings that were carried in the TV Times. <clears throat> Newspapers and media organisations also have to pay a substantial fee at the beginning of each football season for permission to publish football fixtures and sports fixtures. Now, the law slightly changed in recent times um, thanks to a fresh ruling from the European Court, which I won't go into now. Did I hear Brexit? Any, say, uh, someone say Brexit at all. Um, anyway, the principle of copyright remains the same. It's about protecting someone's original work. Artistic works include, as it says there, photography, painting, sculptures, maps and drawings. And it may surprise you to know that maps are protected by copyright. In fact, in 2001, the Automobile Association was sued by the Mapmaker Ordnance Survey after the AA used ord Ordnance Survey maps as the basis for producing its own maps. Now, what Ordnance Survey was able to prove the plagiarism because, and you may not realise this, it had deliberately put in some tiny mistakes into its own maps, and these was, were re reproduced in the AA material. So, the case was settled out of court with the Automobile Association paying substantial damages. So again, don't take maps uh, off the internet because they're not yours. Now, for Rotary Clubs, maps have implications because you may organise a fun run, you may organise a, ha a half marathon. For some reason, you may want to produce a map of the route in some form. And I had a call from a Rotary Club in Berkshire asking about creating a a map for their Santa run. So for sure you can do this freehand and there are some apps on the web which allows you to create free maps, but don't just plonk a map from the Ordnance Survey because you are breaching copyright. Um, and yeah, going back to my newspaper days, we used to each weekend, we produced a weekend walk feature uh, describing how you could spend a few hours in the countryside at the weekend pick your way along a, a picturesque route and find your, find a pub before staggering home. We didn't take a map of Ordnance Survey, although you can buy the license. We used an artist to just produce a freehand drawing and key points along the map, and that sufficed. And in preparing this presentation, I've tried to think of as many rotary eventualities where you might come across copyright. Now, this may seem a little bit fringy for some clubs, but do you organise any church services with productions of hymn sheets and, and the playing of music? Um, it's Remembered Sunday, for example, this weekend. 
Again, think about that originality test. That is someone's work, so someone owns the copyright. Now, my knowledge of, of ecclesiastical copyright is not hot. So I headed to church last weekend and after a confession and a few Hail Marys, I spoke to a vicar friend of mine about how churches uh, approach copyright. And he said that for non-Church of England churches, he suspects copyright laws get broken most months. However, the law is clear, he said. With hymns, only ly lyrics and music over 100 years old are not subject to copyright. All others are, unless the creators expressly said that people can freely use the works, which is rare. You cannot change the words of a hymn or a song without the author's permission, although most people do. And according to my vicar friend, who, by the way, here's summoning me, summoning me for confession tomorrow morning, Church of England churches are encouraged to obtain a copyright license to cover all hymns and songs they use. And they do this through something called Christian copyright licensing, which will ask churches quarterly what songs and hymns they use and they will adjust their annual fee accordingly. So for Rotary Clubs, if you are holding an event at a church, then ask about Christian copyright licensing. Whenever you publish a hymn sheet or an order of service for a wedding, strictly speaking, you should print a license number on the sheet. Now, I didn't know that. And in fact, probably most organizers don't. Finally, if music is performed in church, or a recording is played, you need a license for this. Churches should have a performing rights license, so it is worth checking. Ultimately, the test for copyright is the originality of the work. Someone's time and effort went into creating an original piece of work, which you cannot simply steal for your website or your publication. So I hope you're all still with me at this stage and no one's fallen asleep but just to recap the bottom line is if you create the work you are the owner and you hold the copyright if it's not your work you need to get permission to use that material pure and simple freelance writers or um, freelance photographers own the copyright of their work unless they have signed an agreement with whoever they've sold that work to in the first place. This is important. If you lift extracts from an article, then you can do so, so long as it is an extract and not all of the content, and so long as you credit the author. There's no copyright in rewriting facts from another source and making you your own but to wholesale lift a story from another publication is a breach of copyright. Now, this is an example from a feature which appeared in an issue of Rotary magazine. The article was from the Irish Independent about the Bikes for Africa scheme, which is being run by Rotary clubs in Ireland, where unwanted bikes are being refurbished by prisoners and then sent to Africa where they are helping with mobility. The bikes are collected by Rotarians in the community in the first place. Now, if I wanted to lift this article and the images wholesale and republish it in Rotary magazine, that, as you probably guessed by now, is a breach of copyright. But for Rotary magazine, I wanted to republish the article in full because I think it's, it showcases the, the project brilliantly. So I contacted the Irish Independence Office in Dublin explain what I wanted to do. And the news editor said that he was happy for Rotary Magazine to republish the feature, both the words and the pictures without cost, so long as a credit was given um, to the newspaper in the magazine feature, which was a small price to pay. So the moral of the story is ask, and you'll be surprised what you get sometimes if you approach media organizations and say, can I borrow that piece? Can I publish that piece in my own publication? So let's go back to images, because this is the area which is giving most concern to Rotary. The bottom line of the law is this, the person taking the photograph 
owns the copyright. So even if I give someone my mobile phone to a fellow Rotarian taking a picture of me tucking into my rubbery chicken dinner uh, at one of our club's weekly meetings to then post on my social media, even though the image has been taken with my mobile phone, the copyright rests with the person who took it. The reason is because they use their artistry, their skill, their effort to, to capture that magic moment. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But let me show you just how crazy this is by introdu introducing you to Naruto, who is a rare crested macaque monkey who lives in the Tangoko Reserve on the Indonesian island of Sulawesi. Now, British wildlife photographer David Slater was taking pictures of the monkeys or the macaques when Naruto picked up Slater's camera and took a selfie. This photograph went viral and it actually sparked a two year battle involving the animal charity Peter, who sued on behalf of the monkey, saying that because the monkey took the picture, he owned the copyright. In 2017, American judges ruled that the monkey was ineligible to hold copyright over the image. But under a copyright, I'm oh, sorry, under a compromise, Mr. Slater agreed to donate 25% of any future revenue from the images to charities dedicated to, pro to, to protecting macaques in Indonesia. Talk about the world going nuts. By the way, a quick backstory about this picture. This picture is copyright and it had been, I had originally sourced this. Um, sorry, I'll start again. It, it has been sourced. Um, through an Adobe stock license. Now, I'd originally approached uh, an agency in Birmingham which sells the image, and they were asking $225 for this one image. That's $150 for the webinar and $75 for additional use on the YouTube vi video. But thanks to my good friend, Mr. Dyer, he bought the image for much less through Adobe stock. And here it is today. Phil, you're on the call currently. Did you want to talk a little bit about Adobe stock licenses and how they work? Yeah. Ch uh, cheers, Dave. So um, uh, I use Adobe as a uh, piece of software for the graphics work that I do. And they have a bolt on suite called Adobe stock, as Dave says. And you can buy a subscription to that. Uh, but this particular image here indicated here is... <clears throat> downloaded there you can download it as a single image so this image uh, that i've got now licensed for 500,000 copies of uh cost two pound 39 uh to put it into perspective so the image that dave was talking about was uh nearly 300 pounds there uh split over a webinar use and future use but uh adobe stock as other um uh websites uh websites out there have a purchase facility and what you will find is, and we're going to come on to that later, that there are some free uh, websites to get images are, but the better images are usually paid for. Uh, it's a, it's an adage of life that the more you pay, the better, better it is. Uh, so, but Adobe Stock is a very useful website and it's something that I use a lot, Dave. So uh, I hope this uh, image portrays the story well, uh, but... Um, yeah, that's what that's what I do. Two pound thirty nine for five hundred thousand uh, images. Uh, and do you have to I pay think... an upfront cost, Phil, for Adobe Stock? Uh, no, it's a, it, uh, I personally have a subscription on a monthly basis uh, because I use that for uh, for Rotary and for 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 work. Um, but you can just go in and buy one image, and uh, it doesn't matter whether you've got a subscription or not. The cost is the same. Um, and there is an enhanced license. And there is an extended license, but they're for commercial uh, reselling. So if I wanted to put this image on a T-shirt, my license doesn't cover that uh, because that would be resold. And there's a different license for that. And the, clearly that license is much more expensive. But for digital and print purposes, uh, £2.39 gives me the license to replicate this 500,000 times. Um there are another couple of rules with it. I won't go into today. So I hope that helps. Thanks for uh, asking, Dave. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So what we're trying to show is that there are there are these sort of 
practical workarounds to, to help you in terms of um, you know creating images for, um, for 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 what you want to do. And, and James will will we'll talk about that shortly. Let me just move on a second here. Um, let, let's talk, talk about social media, if I may, because social media, as we've already discovered, um, provides all sorts of issues with with the potential that clubs can be punished for simply sharing a post where the original poster has used an image which they did not have copyright for. Now, I'll be blunt with the case study which I gave earlier. This is really an untested area. The Copyright Designs and Patents Act was written in 1988 before the internet was born. And while the likes of Mark Zuckerberg was a, um, a nerdy student at high school in New Hampshire before heading to Harvard University in 2004, where with some fellow students, they launched Facebook, which, by the way, was originally called Face Mash. Now, I asked a lawyer friend of mine who specializes in media law about the issue of images on the Internet um, and copyright breaches on social media. And he admitted that his company is dealing with publishers who have had pictures agencies and third party agencies pursue them for using those images without permission. And he said this, unfortunately, it is a real risk when using photos without permission, as the claims are usually next to impossible to resist and often result in the payment of inflated fees. Therefore, he added, if people reproduce images on social media and do not own copyright or do not have a license to use them, they are infringing copyright and will be open to claims for breach of copyright. So what he's saying is that with images you, you use on social media platforms, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc., you just can't lift that image and publish it without the owner's consent. I know we all do it. And, you know, are we going to get caught? But people are. So it doesn't matter what your privacy settings are on your social media or how many followers you have. If you're caught, it's theft. Now, you may say, and quite rightly so, many newspapers um, ignore this and publish freely. And they do. The Mail Online is classic. It often is publishing pictures on there which it doesn't have permission for. Um, it publishes first and deals with it later, often asking for permission later on down the line. But they've got the legal muscle to fight any copyright breach. Newspapers may pay the fee, in fact, because they make their money on advertising, on newspaper sales and on digital traffic. They may consider the payment of that fine and investment set against the increased uh, sales or digital hits on the website, which brings in their advertising revenue. For Rotary, we cannot accept such a gamble. So if you do not own the copyright, I'm sorry this is sounding like a scratch record. If you do not own the copyright, get consent um, and then credit the owners and possibly pay for the usage. In truth, if you see a story um, on a friendly Facebook page about a Rotary event, common sense would suggest to contact the Facebook page owner and ask them for more details um, and consent to use their words and images. I do that all the time. I'm going, I have a, a Facebook page Rotary editor. I'm seeing images there and often I'm going to the sources of them and saying, can I use them? 99, 100 times out of 100, it's always yes. The one time it isn't, as they don't get back to me. Anyway, um, they're very grateful to the coverage. This briefly um, is just the penalties for breaches of copyright. Um, as we know now from what Rotary is facing, the penalties can be severe. So be warned. In terms of defences, these are not easy to come by, um, as was suggested by my um, lawyer friend. Um, there is a sort of public interest defence, which I'm not going to go into to now. Um, but in a sense, the, the breach is, is clear. And how can you defend the indefensible? This is an important slide and a critical distinction to make in, in understanding 
the difference between copyright and privacy, which are two very different areas of law. I'm also trying to pick up here on a question which was asked on the on the um, uh, pre-submitted questions. Because in dealing with some concerns from Rotarians, they have said to me, I can't take a picture of that person at the Rotary the Rotary event because it's a breach of copyright. No, it isn't. Here, and in that case, we're dealing with privacy. Copyright is about ownership of an image, an article, a piece of music. Privacy is a whole different ball game. And you'll be surprised to know that there is no breach of law if I was to take a picture of any of you walking down the, the high street this afternoon. You might not like it, but if I take that photograph in a public place, it's not a problem. However, if any of you take a picture of me sunbathing in my back garden in my lime green mankini, a garden protected by a high wall, and which you would have taken from um, a, a, a view overhead, as distasteful as that picture is, you've breached my privacy. Now, I hear talk about GDPR and data protection, but that's irrelevant. We're guided on by law set down by the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights. That's Article 8 Privacy and Article 10 Freedom of Expression. So when we're taking pictures in a public setting, it, it's not an issue. In reality, so the theory, in reality, when you are taking photographs at a Rotary event, it's ethically sound and good practice to ask permission to take someone's photo. Why wouldn't you? But if you are taking a general crowd shot, it's logistically and practically impossible to ask everyone for permission. So this is privacy, remember, not copyright. One final point. The one area to be concerned with, with taking pictures is when it concerns children. From a privacy point of view, you need the permission of a parent or guardian to take an image of, every, of anyone under the age of 16. That is good ethical practice. That is enshrined by the Independent Press Standards Organization and what is known as the Editor's Code of Practice, which, though not specifically um, applicable to Rotary Club websites, should serve as a guiding point of practice and is what we apply in the publication of the magazine. So there you go. Sorry, I should have put those on earlier. So um, you can take pictures in public, but ask permission. And with children under 16, you need to get permission from a parent or guardian. So I've spent the last half an hour or so wittering on about what you can't do, um, which is instructive, I guess, but it's hardly helpful. So what can you do? After all, I spend a lot of my time um, going around the country, delivering talks to Rotary Clubs, telling you the importance of telling Rotary story. And what I don't want you to do is to suddenly clam up because of the, of the fear of copyright. As Rotarians, how can you freely publicise the work that you're doing on your club website, on social media, in newsletters and in mainstream media without fearing um, a, a snotty email from um, a, a photo agency demanding money for breach of copyright. Well, for the majority of this, this presentation, I have been using copyright free images from a website called Unsplash. I've typed in the image I, I wanted, I've downloaded it, and then added a source uh, with each slide. And actually, if you were to click on the save presentation, the byline credit would take you to that link of the source. Creative Commons is another website you can use, but do be careful with honouring terms and conditions. Another legal friend of mine was contacted by people who had used a Creative Commons photo, but they had neglected to comply with one of the conditions of the site where they obtained the photograph. They, they forgot to give the photographer a byline. And that omission resulted in invoices of £300 and £400 which the recipients had little choice but to pay. So the lesson is if you are using free, these free sites, be careful with the conditions. Um, make sure that you, you honor the conditions of the, of the site 
um, and, and read the terms and conditions really, really carefully. Um, I use Un Unsplash quite a bit. Um, and in Google, you can use their advanced searches for copyright free photographs. But again, please check the provenance of those images. And if in doubt, don't. Now, I've listed on here some other sites where you can source free images from. But do check the terms and conditions, do log in. Um, and sometimes the better pictures do require a premium cost. Um, now in James's presentation, which follows mine, uh, he's gonna show practically how you can use pictures from uh, Unsplash, Pixabay, Pexel, and from Canva. And he's also gonna be talking about Brand Center. So again, really, these are how to's. How can you move forward by being aware of the copyright risks out there? Another good place to source free pictures is Canva, which is a, a good resource. I frequently use uh, uh, Canva to create graphics. Um, you pay about a tenner a month um, for an even wider selection of images, which I think my my good friend Mr. Dyer subscribes to Phil. Do you did you want to talk um about Canva and and, and how you use it? Yeah, Canva. Uh, thank you, Dave. Yes, uh, Canva is a great uh, uh, product. There is a free account that you can uh, utilize. Uh, but as Dave says, for maximum fu uh, functionality, uh, you can subscribe for a um, a pro account. Is what they call it uh, now. A pro account is available free of charge to charitable organizations. And if you search on um, the Canva website for a, a charitable account, uh, you can uh, apply for a free account. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of the process, but you need to put in um, uh, maybe the articles of agreement or the charity commission uh, details and they come back and validate it and you, you get that account free uh, as dave says it's about 10 or 11 pounds a month if you can't do that like i say i use it for rotary but i also use it for in work um it's very innovative and um james bolton is going to show us a live session on canva and how that uh, works uh it has a great library of images and you are comfortable knowing that those images are um, part of your license, uh, whether that's a free license that you've got through Rotary or a charity or a paid for license. Uh, they are all licensed to you for use. Uh, so that's great. Yeah, Canva, really good. Um, I hope that helps, Dave. Thank you. No, th no thank you for that. This, the, these are two graphics which I created. Um, not using premium this is i just use this for my rotary club this summer for a couple of events there i was useless at art at school i'm not that creative in that sense there but this was fairly easy to do i did each of these in half an hour it wasn't that difficult i just picked up the uh, the templates and i worked with them so um it's out there and as phil said there are you can get the advanced the the the, the picture library um, with a premium subscription um, as, as a charity through Rotary, GB and I, you can do that. We will put this in the frequently asked questions in a sheet that follows there. I certainly know that the um, General Secretary Amanda Watkins, she was telling me this week that she's used Canva successfully using that premium account. So uh, I shall tap her for more information about that. Um, I'm going to um, mention, I'm going to bring in Phil again on this one as well, actually, which will help. But Regarding music, um, copyright lasts 70 years, but clearly, you know, you, you're going to think about maybe adding music to that video you've got um, that you're going to upload to YouTube. Earlier this year, um, I organised the Rotary 1090 District Conference, that's Rotary in the Thames Valley District Conference in Oxford, where we wanted to use walk-on music every time a speaker took the stage. And again, here we're entering not only the twin threat of copyright, but also that of royalties too. So copyright means that you can use the material with the author's permission, or you've paid for the privilege, but you may also have to pay royalties too. So ideally you want to find music that is both copyright and royalty free. So there I went to my friend, Phil Dyer, and said, Phil, 
how can I get the music? And Phil, you talked about a site which you use called Envato. Uh, yeah, so uh, those that were listening uh, eagerly this morning at the beginning of this webinar, there was a little short piece of music that we played. Uh, that piece of music was sourced from the Envato website. Uh, uh, Audio Jungle is part of that website. Uh, again, you can buy um, individual items. So these are photographs, video clips, uh, GIFs, automated graphics, uh, photos, music, uh, lots of lots of different um, media that you can buy from this website. But we're talking about music here. And as, as Dave says, you need to be looking for copyright free, but also royalty free music. Now, the better the music or the longer the music, the more, the more it costs. The little piece of music that we've played here today was literally a couple of pounds. Uh, in fact, it's it's part of a subscription that I have, uh, but it's a couple of pounds. And then you've got in perpetuity rights to use that piece of music. Um, so just be careful of that. One of the things that you've also got to be careful with, and I'm going to just uh, ask Dave just to watch me on a couple of these words here, but there is... Um, when you're playing music in a live environment and it's not recorded, you need a PRS license, a Performing Rights Society license, and, and there's no problem. And then you can play virtually anything that you want. As soon as you record that, it, it takes on a different form, particularly if you upload that media that you've now recorded to YouTube, because that is outside of the PRS license. PRS only covers the live broadcast of music, whether it's played out from a from a CD or a streaming service uh, or, or live music. But as soon as you put it onto YouTube, YouTube's algorithm will be listening to your music. And as you upload it, those that have been familiar with the YouTube uploading experience, you get to stage three and you'll get a copyright strike or a copyright claim where you have the opportunity to remove the offending piece of work or delete the file. They're the only options. Take it down, i.e. no video, or remove it, and you have to mute it out. So be very, very careful. So if you are recording an event and there is some copyrighted music in the background, YouTube will stop that in its tracks. I use the Envato website. I find it very, very easy to use. It stores everything that I've downloaded and it allows me to keep them in project files so I know what piece of music I've used for each dif different event, the membership summit, together talks, and all the other bits and pieces that we've done in focus that we've done for Rotary Great Britain Island this last few years, really. So I hope that helps, Dave. Thank you very much. No, that's perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, Facebook as well. Um, I. I um, Privately, it was uh, recorded uh, uh, um, something with, with my son uh, singing along to a Queen track or, or reacting to a Queen track. And I put it on, on Facebook and Facebook um, muted the sound because of the, 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 the um, you couldn't play um, the Queen in the background. So um, it, it is a bizarre system. Nearly at the end here. So um, really some, some takeaways, really, which I want to come to. What what do you need to do? What What should you do? So. What should you do if you receive a dreaded email from Getty Images um, or PixRights? Well, the first thing to do is don't ignore it. What you should do straight away is, unless you have proof that um, you license the image in the first place, is to remove it from your website and the library. Remember, this provides a firm stop date for the alleged infringement. And then what you can do is to replace the image with a royalty-free image from the sites we've suggested this morning. Secondly, do your homework. Find out how much um, money the image was being licensed for if you can, or seek out another stock photo site to see similar images, just to assess uh, what is a fair market price. <clears throat> the photo agency is only entitled to recover what is known as actual damages or the pre precise amount which would have been paid for the image in the first place, okay? There should not be <clears throat> any administration costs, processing costs, or add-on costs. It is purely the actual damages. And then, th then thirdly, respond. Send them a professionally written email 
explain the situation, explain Rotary. And you might just care to ask the agency how they reach their price and see if you can negotiate down. Above all, however, when you do receive such a demand, go through your website and delete any images which you don't have permission for. What else? Well, I certainly hope this webinar has given you a greater understanding of the copyright law and its application and given you food for thought about your own Rotary Club and district and maybe your own personal use. Certainly, you should think about conducting an audit of your website to check for the propriety of any images or general content. The bottom line is that if they are yours or if you have the photographer's consent, then you've got nothing to worry about. I also think that you should speak to club members to make sure they are aware. You know, this week's meetings, talk to them about the webinar today. Um, maybe even a future date, uh, play, play this webinar to them. Because again, if everyone is aware about public image in your Rotary Club, it's going to help to alleviate these sort of costs, which you don't need. Raising awareness is a, is a key ingredient of this messaging. Another bottom line is, as we've said many times, is get permission. You'll be surprised if you take the courtesy of asking the copyright only, owner. Maybe they will help you again in the future. So my aim today is not being to, to worry you. It's not to make your website um, boring, since these are really important showcases of what we do. However, it's important that they are legal and safe. Many of you in your clubs will use the Rotary GBNI templated website, which has been put together by um, Chris Sweeney from the Rotary Club of Connie. Um, and certainly when you're putting pictures on your Rotary Club website, there is a tick box when you upload those images, which says, where did you get this from? And to make sure you've got copyright. Now, to be blunt, you could sidestep that, just tick yes and upload and you'd still get done. But that is, a, is certainly a key point we have on those Rotary Club templates, which is asking you, are you sure of the provenance of that picture? So some of you may have created your own Rotary Club websites and you won't have that tick box mechanism, but maybe you should think about it to make sure that you don't slip in, into, into, um, into a situation where you are getting those demands. So again, don't, for, don't be afraid to ask the, the owner for their permission. Um, and that really is it from me. A lot of ground has, has been covered, and I know this session has been recorded for, for future reference. I don't deny some of the copyright law is sketchy, certainly around that social media, but the threat is real if you breach. And all I can do as a fellow Rotarian is, is advise and establish what might be the boundaries of copyright, what the law is and how it applies. As a newspaper editor, I've had to wrestle with some difficult legal issues in my time, perhaps whenever we're about to publish something which um, is hitting the boundaries of, defam of defamation. But my motto was always this, if in doubt, leave it out. And the mantra has always worked for me. And with that, Mr. Dyer, I think we're going to move on to uh, to deal with uh, a video from uh, James Bolton, and then we'll be very happy to take some questions. Yes, that's great. Uh, that is correct, Dave, and that is great. Uh, phenomenal uh, food for thought there. Um, certainly what you've said with regard to the recording, because I think even people watching this today will realise that they need to review uh, what's been said, uh, because there's some real nuggets of information inside this webinar so far. So uh, without further ado, uh, we're going to just do a small session now, which has been pre-recorded by James Bolton. Uh, James is the communication manager, uh, a staff member at Rotary Great Britain and Ireland. And he's been kind enough to prepare a, a short video. It's about 10 minutes long uh, from recollection, and it will go through some of the practical applications associated with Dave's presentation. And then we'll get to the meat in the sandwich and go through the questions. And I have to say, there are lots. Uh, there will be some dis disappointed people here today because there are 
there are a lot of questions. Let's just do the best we can and go through that. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to uh, James Bolton, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about copyright and the practicalities. Cheers, James. The first place for you to make sure that you're visiting is the Rotary International Brand Centre. This is accessible via My Rotary and the Rotary GBNI members area, or by heading there directly at brandcentre.rotary.org. Just note the American spelling of the word centre. The Brand Centre itself recently removed its requirement to log in and has undergone a significant redesign, so it's much easier to find and access the materials you're looking for. Now the Brand Centre itself is full of loads of useful information, templates and downloads, including a place to make your own club logo, create people of action adverts and much more. But what we're looking at today is the Brand Centre's image library. There are currently over 400 images for download on there, showcasing what Rotary is all about. So from our areas of focus and global humanitarian projects to networking and social collaboration. The images are from real Rotary projects and events, with many, many of the people featured wearing Rotary branded clothing to add extra authenticity to your images. So once you're on the brand center, uh, on the home page, you can see there's a menu across the top with home, our brand, downloads and templates. So the menu that you need to head to is downloads and you'll see there's a secondary menu pointing towards images, videos and audio. So if we press view, you can see you've got another series of options. So if you feel like you know what you're looking for, whether you're looking for polio images, uh, images of some of the youth programs, you can click on these options and it automatically filters the results for you. But what we're gonna do is press view all. So there you can see it's brought up all of the downloads within the brand center. So on this filter menu here, we can press asset type and images and then press apply. So that brings up all 450 images that are on the Brand Centre and available for you to download. So for the purposes of this, we're going we're gonna to use uh, this image here because it, it's sort of demonstrating Rotary in the community. They're working on a, looks like a restoration project of a, maybe a community centre or something like that. And you think that's a good way to encapture what, what your club does and what clubs across Great Britain and Ireland do. So all you have to do is select the image you want and then press download and it will probably open a new tab for you and then at the bottom your picture has been downloaded. So from the filter menu you can also select the drop down which is our causes. So this will separate all of the images into each of Rotary 7 areas of focus including end polio now. So if you're perhaps putting together some materials for a polio fundraiser that your club's hosting, you can head to the Brand Centre and just find polio related images. And if you click on each image, it will also give you a bit of a description about the image and probably the information about where it was taken, if you want to include that on something like a caption or a social media post. Uh, so this image just here sh shows that it's of health workers who are going door to door uh, doing polio immunizations in India. And this one just here shows that it's an immunization drive in Nigeria. So that can be really helpful just to add a bit of context uh, to the images, like say whether it's a caption or a social media post, just add to that more detail, which is really helpful uh, element of the brand center. So I've touched on the Rotary International Brand Centre there. So secondly, what I'm going to do is flag up three other useful sites which contain copyright free stock images. There's also illustrations, video and even audio on there. So all you'll have to do is sign up to free accounts on these websites to gain access to thousands of stock resources. So the first of those three websites is called unsplash.com. So unsplash is one of the most popular copyright free image sites online at the moment and specializes in high quality photography. So as you can see across the top, they've got a search bar and they've also got a topics menu here as well to help you find the images that you're looking for. So let's say on this occasion, you're hosting a recycling project with your Rotor Kids or Interact Club. So what you can do in the search bar, enter recycling, and then it will bring up all of the images that relate to that topic. So we can have a browse through, Let's say you're doing a bit of a flyer, maybe some social media posts to promote what you've been doing. 
So I'm going to go for this one just here. So all of the recycled uh, items in buckets. So you can see in the top right hand corner there, it says download free. And the little arrow gives you various sizes so you can either download the small, medium, large or original version. So I'm going to go for original because that's the highest quality so you can also use that for print as well as digital. So if you click that and the image will simply download for you. One thing that Unsplash does have that other copyright free image sites don't have so much of is current affairs and images that relate to things that are in the news. So if you go back to the Unsplash homepage, there's a section here called current events. So by clicking on that, you can see images that relate to things that are in the news at the moment. So this might be uh, natural disasters. There's lots of images to do with the war in Ukraine. There's even a few images about Queen Elizabeth II there. So this is quite helpful because one of the harder things to get hold of image wise is images that relate to the news because those images are valuable they cost money so being able to get access to free images is really helpful for clubs who want to talk about current affairs so it might be in your district magazine for example or on your club's social media pages you're talking about things like the war in Ukraine maybe in the past you might have spoken about COVID-19 those sorts of topics are the things that are covered within the current events section. So again, they're all available for you to use. Click on an image and press download free and it starts for you. The second free site that we're going to have a look through is called pixabay.com. So very similar to Unsplash, they've got a huge variety of copyright free stock images. But something that it's got that probably sets it apart from Unsplash is that it's also got a huge amount of illustrations, videos and music as well. So for this one I'm just going to show you uh, the music section. So across the top uh, menu if you press music. So for the example here I'm going to say you're looking for some festive music to maybe use on your club's Facebook page to post a Christmas message. So if we search Christmas in the search box it will bring through a series of results so you will have to go through and listen to them see which ones sort of take your fancy so let's try this one called Christmas Story it's got quite a, a title that you might think will be relevant here so we've had a listen to that we think yep yeah, that's great that's going to work really well on the on the video that we're putting together so again really simple just press download and it will start to download it for you. The final free site that I'm going to flag up for you is called pexels.com. So that's P-E-X-E-L-S. When we've had instances where clubs have been found to have breached copyright, in more cases than not, it's actually been in relation to natural disasters and images from things like floods, hurricanes, maybe forest fires. Uh, this is because clubs often want to use, understandably, a dramatic, high-quality image, perhaps it's for a fundraiser, to really demonstrate the scale of the disaster or the people that are having to live through those conditions. Now those pictures are taken by highly skilled photographers who are on the ground, on the scene, in that disaster. So they're often for sale for hundreds of pounds, which is why that is in breach of copyright because otherwise that artist or photographer would have been able to sell that picture. So what I'm going to do using Pexels is just show how you can use stock photos to work equally well when it comes to things like fundraising for natural disasters. So what I'm going to do is search for flood and see what images come up there. You can see there is a range of images there, some really high quality ones, this one for example. So although we don't know specifically which disaster this relates to, you might think that's suitable, it looks like it's in a similar part of the world, you can even press more info and sometimes it will show you where that picture has been taken, but this one, on this occasion it doesn't. So maybe we say we're not sure about that one, let's keep looking. So if we keep scrolling down we'll come across these images here, which are taken from above. So although they don't show people, maybe that's a good thing for us because it doesn't necessarily pin down a certain location for this disaster. 
So we can see these pictures from above. It shows the scale of the destruction. And we can see it's probably, it's not a European disaster by the look of the houses, potentially in somewhere like Southeast Asia. So if that relates to the specific disaster that you're fundraising for, for example, this might be an image that can demonstrate the impact of a flood without it having to be connected to a specific disaster. So if we click on, we can see that it's free to use. Again, just like the other sites, you can press free download and that download will start. Now on this occasion, on Pexels, you can also, if you choose to, donate to the photographer. That might be something that you feel like you would like to do as well. So Canva is an all-in-one design studio. It's one of the most powerful tools for amateur content creators and professional communication teams alike. It has an unbelievable range of templates, the ability to create your own brand toolkit with fonts and colors, and for the purpose of this demo, a huge image and video library as well. And the great thing about Canva is that they have a pro version with more stock images and more video, which is available for free for non-profit organizations. So that's something definitely worth investigating for your club or district. So let's take a closer look. So I've used one of Canva's more basic templates uh, to mock up a club networking event. So this could be, this in particular is an Instagram post. So as you can see down the left hand side here, there's lots of options for what you can add to the post. So we're gonna click onto photos and then there's a search function. So I'm gonna put in networking because it's a networking event and it returns the results. So you can drag and drop different images in, experiment and see what works for you. So we'll just pop this image in here. So that works quite well, but we'll maybe have a look at some of the others. So you can have a look at this one, handshake here. So I'm gonna go with the first one. So pop that back in. And as well as events, I've also gone ahead and made one for a project. So this one, again, we, we had an example earlier from a recycling project. This is a similar one just here, a community litter pick. You can put litter pick into the search and again, it returns lots of images and it's just a case of experimenting, having a browse, seeing which ones work for you. So I'm gonna go for that one. And then there's just a share option at the top and you can press download in whatever format you need. And that's all done. And there's a huge library of video images. So it doesn't have to just be one image. You can easily pick four or five on a certain template that work for you. So they were five resources that are available for clubs and districts to overcome the challenges of copyright and copyright free images. The first was Rotary International's Brand Center. That's the place to go for all your Rotary branded images. Then I showed you three copyright free image libraries. That was unsplash.com, pixabay.com and pexels.com. And finally, we had a quick look at Canva. Canva is the all-in-one design studio, which includes a huge range of templates, videos and images which is perfect if you're just getting started with design or if you're really familiar and want to expand your skills even more. As I said, Canva does have a free pro version which is available for non-profits. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, it was certainly further information that reinforces the position that Dave made earlier and give you some practical applications and some real live tutelage on how to use uh, some of those websites there. Uh, but as I said earlier, before the uh, James uh, video, uh, it's now time for the uh, sort of meeting the sandwich. And we're gonna try and rattle through some questions so uh, bear with us uh, because there are quite a few. Uh, so it might be whistle stop. So here we go. Eyes down, Dave. Um, I've, I've, I've tried to, I've answered about 20 of them on. Um, I've written some answers in the Q&A, by the way. So um, there's, there's, a, there's been a few that I've managed to re reply to. Cut back clip art have come up there. And I've just said there is free clip art and, 
there's free clip art and there's other clip art that you have to pay for as well um uh, so i've so i've tried so enough to, i've gone from the top phil working my way down but i still got 59 yeah. to go so i'm going to go through some of the pre-orchestrated questions first um and this one comes from kevin widdick can rotary great britain and ireland provide central support if a mistake leads to an issue yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, if you do have an issue, um, speak to uh, James and the team at, at Rotary GBI and they, they can certainly assist you uh, there. And and I, I will sometimes uh, be asked to to help out too. Um, there was also another question, I think, which I just answered uh, before in, in the chat, Phil, about um, Rotary's uh, insurance, whether that co covers for um, covers breaches. And unfortunately, as I understand, it doesn't cover uh, there, um, the, uh, the the insurance for a copyright breach, the liability um, would rest with the club. Great, thank you, Dave. Peter Fryer asks, if I substantially alter an image, is it still copyrighted? Yeah, well, it, uh, basically, um, the, the the copyright will, will will always rest with the with the owner in the first place. And if you choose to alter it, um, even to try and make it your own, it's still their image in the first place. So unfortunately, the provenance rests with the with the owner. Yeah. Okay. Dave, uh, Dave Simpson, if something is used for an internal club newsletter, does the copyright issue still stand? Yeah. So I've I've answered a couple of questions similarly about people saying if they've got a private club meeting and using copyright images. To be blunt, if you are if it is a private meeting and it's a it's it's a it's a private newsletter which is not going on the web, then you could use um, copyright images. To be fair, my teaching sometimes because I'm teaching um, in in a in a in a in an area where the images are not going on the web, um, you can do that. So it does depend upon where that letter goes. If you are then sort of let, with with one of my club newsletters on my last club, I actually used to um, uh, upload it to the club website so everyone could see. So if you do that, there's a danger you'll infringe copyright. But if it's just going as a sort of like a round robin email, it, yeah, it, it would be fine. OK, we've got Andrew Hopkins here. How do you find the originator of a photograph when it seems to have been used or copied several times? Yeah, that, that, that's, 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 that's really difficult. We had an issue um, with an image we wanted to use for the last magazine of the, of the, um, the Prince of Wales um, uh, wearing a, a polio um, uh, scarf. And we couldn't find the, 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 originate, the, the originator of the image, so we didn't use it. Um, so, yeah, go to the website. The, the source that you find it and ask them and they may signpost you to the to the original author but unfortunately if you can't find who it is you just don't use it absolutely dave if in doubt leave it out uh, so we're moving to some live questions now uh, brian barber asks can we use quotes freely e.g from winston churchill yeah i mean i, th I think i've I'll answered that one at the top there but i'm um, Quotes are fine. News and facts information information is fine. But you know what's good practice? Attribute it. You know, Winston Churchill said we will fight them on the beaches. Just attribute it. But no, there's no there's no no issue with with quotes. Here's a question from Penny Underwood. Are graphics which are not photographs subject to copyright? Yes, they are. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. How do we find out who owns the copyright from Rene Carlyle? So again, um, wherever you saw that image, or I mean, we're talking mainly about images, clearly, but wherever you saw it, um, again, there's the contact form, ask, ask where it is. You can, again, there was another question about if you right click on the photograph and you can see maybe the, the metadata, but the metadata is not always reliable. You know that for Wellfield, don't you? You can't always be sure that the metadata has been filled in, in completely. So you are slightly taking a risk by taking that photograph based on what that metadata is on, on the image. So be careful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I do some photography as a hobby and uh, it has all the metadata there, but I can remove that or manipulate that to suit what I need. So yes, absolutely. Um, I've got a question here from John Daniel, Rotary Foundation coordinator. We have thousands of, of images in the past 15 years of history on our club website is there any defense that these pictures were posted many years ago 
Yeah, good, good morning, John, and thanks for your help with the foundation stuff. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid the answer is that, yeah, that is a problem. That is the real big problem we have about those historic images. Now, um, these bots have been going for a few years, so one has to say, well, if they haven't found it now, will they ever find it? But my advice would be would be to go through those archives and check, because there'll be some images which you own, uh, but there's some if you're in doubt, just 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 again kick them out. Yeah, and a very similar question from Cal and Nick: Can we employ a company like Pick Rates to swim yeah. our site? Yeah. Good morning, Callan. Um, hope you're well up here, up in Scotland. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. I'm not sure I would want to 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 to, to consult with the enemy <laughs> because actually that might might lead a, a way in there. Um, it sounds awful, but the best way really is is for each of us as a, a club level to take ownership of the issue and go through those 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 sites. Okay, we've got another question here from Chris Drew. This is a good one, Dave. This might stretch here. Uh, how do web bots know if you've acquired an image through Adobe Stock or a you know a legitimate source? How do they well, know you've got a license? Yeah, well, they will do because again, again, they they, they will have the they will have the, the, the they will have the uh, details um, of uh, the the license holders uh, and um, and and that the bots will actually be able to spot the, the they will actually spot when they they pick up the picture that it is an Adobe picture and therefore it would have the license. So what 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 these bots are doing is they are sweeping the web. They are looking at these images. They are interrogating the metadata in those images and saying, where do they get an image from? Oh, that's one of ours. Do they have permission for it? If they do, it's fine. If they don't, then you'll get the bill. Excellent. Well done. Uh, when people send, this is from Terry Condor. When people send us pics taken at an event. Do we have de facto permission to use? Again, it goes back to that privacy thing. This is not copyright. Um, the, the so there's no copyright in the taking the picture. Um, when people have taken pictures of general crowd scenes, one would assume there's what's called informed consent has been has taken place there. Um, the good practice is when you you take pictures, judge it. You know, if there are young children involved, I might be inclined not to use it unless I can be absolutely sure. The person who I got the photograph from, do I trust them? Are they reliable? So, again, there's a few decisions to be made before you'd actually choose to publish. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've got an, a question here from Rex Andrew. Is a freehand drawn map copyright? No, it's not, Rex. Go ahead. Do it. That's what I was saying earlier. Um, you know, if you are, let's say you're doing a Santa Fun run and you're charting the route around the town centre and you do it freehand, Actually, it's copyrighted your copyright. Excellent. We've got a question here from Keith Harris. How long should we keep copy of the consent? As Dave previously pointed out, sometimes there are copies of an image saved in the archive folder. Gosh, that is a, that is a good good question, Keith. Um, uh, well, to be fair, if you if you if you've got consent for it. Um, one thing to do is, is this thing about the metadata, right click on it and put the, 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 the number in there. What would you say, Phil, if you were thinking about the, the license that you had? Yeah, you... I, I, I just think you keep, you keep a record of it. I know when I create a project for whatever I'm doing, everything yeah. for that project goes in there. So the pictures, the licenses, the consents, mm -hmm. everything goes in that folder. And then I just forget about it. And then it's there uh, and it's back to the cloud, but it's something that, um, you know, it does take a bit of management. It's something that we're now managing that we didn't previously have to do. I mean, it's a small, small thing to do. You know, when you've got an image, you just, just, just accept where you got it from. Yeah, just having a quick look through now. Uh, we've touched on Google Maps and it, uh, Google Maps, and yeah, uh, let's have a quick look <laughs> about what about using logos for charities. There's a yeah. few questions in. I just go Google Maps for, first of all. Google Maps again. Check. You know, Google Maps, you need to get permission from Google on that one. So you need to have a, a permission from Google for that, you know, because it, it is their map. But there is a license agreement there, which you can find about Google Maps. With logos, with charity logos, strictly speaking, um, they are they're, they are the charity's um, copyright. If you use that, that charity's logo, are they going to sue you? That's going to be the biggest own goal 
um, going, it, it is unlikely that they would sue you for it. So, you know, for example, the shelter box logo, um, if you use that, technically it's their logo, but they're not going to sue you for it. So, it, yeah, it, it's about yeah. being sensible. If a, so, here's one from Penny Underwood. If Rotarians create posters on Canva, who owns the copyright, the Rotarian or the club? Uh, the Rotarian. Excellent. Very good. That was succinct. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm trying to kick rattle through them um, there. It's a bit like a freelance photographer um, working for a newspaper. Um, they will often own the photograph unless the newspaper themselves or the organisation says, right, you, we, we're going to take that and we're going to sell that picture on and we take the royalties for it. Trevor, Trevor Harrison mentions, can we use part of a piece of a music for, say, a music topic in a quiz? No. Um, but again, it's about where that where that quiz is held, really. Um, uh, and Phil, you know, you're you're the music buff here. But um, if it. In a sense, is is that's almost a, a performing rights thing, correct? But, um, but in terms of copyright, it becomes copyright if you put that quiz online. Correct, absolutely. So if you're using it in a pub and it's live and you're not recording it, uh, the pub more than likely will have a PRS license. If they've got a license for Sky Telly, etc., there will be a license in play, and you can benefit from that license. But as soon as you record it or put it onto Vimeo or uh, to YouTube, then that's where the uh, the fun starts. I've got a, a question from Rick Cannon, uh, District Governor, twelve hundred. Uh, can the club take action if their images are used without permission by third parties? Um, you, you could do it, um, but again, then it's the enforceability of the law. You could do if someone's using it, um, and especially using it in, in, a, in a way which doesn't reflect well on, on the Rotary Club. Yes, you could absolutely write to them and say, um, one, could you take the picture down? Great. Uh, a question about crowd scenes. We hold a duck race, and while we ask permission for individual children from, uh, uh, ch individual children from Guardians, we take crowd scenes which inv inv invariably show children under 16. It would be impossible to get permission. How do we deal with that? So this is this, this is an issue known as informed consent. Um, it's not the same with a duck race, but if you go to a concert or if you go to a, a, a sporting event, on your ticket, it will have on there that, you know, pictures picture will be taken you you it will be accepted as an informed consent there's a you you have a contract there in the first place for copyright now clearly at a duck event or a public event outside um there's there's obviously an element there of where you're clearly not going to um get permission this is not copyright this is privacy again and and, and again it would apply that it would be informed consent the people are there um that, that they're in a public area and it's accepted um, that you can take the picture. You're not technically breaking the law. There's no law to be broken on that. It's more ethical. Great. I've got a question here from Mike Lavender. Can we use images from a film distribution site to add to posters promoting a film night for Rotary? So that's a really good one. I did see that question earlier. If you have got permission from the film company to show that film as part of a promotion, I know we've done that quite a lot within Rotary. We did it with the film Breathe, didn't we? The polio film there. We will have had permission from the film distributors to use their merchandise, to use their materials. So you'd still need to get that permission, but clearly that permission would have been given in the first place as part of the marketing because because they would want that film to, re to receive as wide an audience as possible. So yes, technically copyright, you'd need to ask permission, but that permission would be easily given. I've got a question here from Sarah Hughes. Once you've removed any offending images from your websites and social media, can you be pursued retrospectively? Well, no, once it's off your website, that's it, you're done. Um, it's a bit like John Donnell's concern, you know, they've got loads of them, so you need to get them off. So, yeah, if you take, once, once they, they're gone, there will not be a trace. Here's a good question from Mark Mudd. What, what's the position if an image I took in a public place contains copyrighted material, for example, an advertising board or a background image or music? Okay, that is known as accidental inclusion. Take, for example, the set of EastEnders, where there will be a picture maybe of, of in the bar of, um, at Albert Square, for example. There'll be 
pictures on there, but that is known as accidental inclusion and you can use it. So for example, you might be in the Louvre Gallery. I um, don't know if you can take pictures in the Louvre Gallery, but anyway, you're in the, in the gallery there and you're taking a, uh, and I'm taking a picture of Phil uh, um, looking all, all sprightly with um, Mona Lisa behind. That's it, that's, the, not, that's your Saturday pose, Phil. Um, you're not breaching the copyright of taking the Mona Lisa behind, but if you were to take a specific picture of the Mona Lisa, then you've breached the copyright. But with the Mona Lisa behind and me taking a picture of Phil, that's known as accidental inclusion, and you can do that. Very good, very good. Thank you for that, Dave. Uh, we've got an anonymous now. So these are the tricky ones where people don't even want to declare who's sent the question. Uh, okay, that's fine. I create posters for Rotary Clubs and events which have multiple images on. They are layered and edited. Who has the copyright? Uh, if you create the, the image, if you create the posters, then the poster is yours. Because if you that's assuming you've used copyright free material to put on it on it in the first place. So you've taken, you've you've curated that those images, you've put it to a poster, and it's your work, you own the copyright. Good question. Good answer. Sorry, Dave. Uh, Roy Romsey, what is consent verbal or must it be in writing? Uh, Roy from Southampton as well. Um, Roy, uh, yeah, it needs to be it needs to be in, in written. Uh, as Phil says, you know, Phil, you know, you, you need to have proof of that. So, yeah, you need to get uh, I would I'd have consent uh, in written form. And that's what I had with the Irish independent example I gave you. Great. I've got a question from Mike Laid here. I've used an image for a route that I run. This is a fellow runner here, Dave, for you. <laughs> yep. Using my Garmin watch. Is it OK to publish that image on social media? Yeah, uh, Mike, you probably, you know, Garmin Strava, as a fellow runner, we put it on all the time. No problem at all. Um, in, in a sense, Garmin and Strava allow that to be published. They're, they are unlikely to sue. Strictly speaking, I guess you could call it copyright. Are they going to sue? No. General question here. I don't know what the answer, if you've got an answer here is, is there any advice for Xmas float music? Uh, well, I, I can answer that probably, Dave. And I would say that you've, uh, you need a performing rights license. Uh, and as long as you've got that license in place, then you're covered. It's a live broadcast of music. And if you've got that license in place, you're covered. Uh, what you will have a problem with is if you put an extract of that float, play the music and upload that to YouTube because you do not have per permission for the upload. You have the permission to play it live, but not the recording of. So that's my answer there. Thank you for Thank that. You. Julie Graham there. Um, here's a question from David Fowler. What about images in club magazines saved in the archive and part of the members area of the club website? Do these have to be deleted? Um, so I'm assuming from David's question that the pictures that they don't own the copyright for. Um, if it is, regrettably, the bots will not distinguish between members areas and public areas. They will find it. Well, Dave, it's it, we are just over now. We, we said 11.30, we're at 11.34. We've got carried away there with the uh, with the frenzy of questions. There are still a lot of questions to be answered. What I'm going to suggest, uh, guys, uh, in the webinar is that we will try and address these and put them as a link into the YouTube description. So it'll be a text-based document with questions and answers. May take us another couple of days to do that. Uh, but I hope you found this session today uh, useful. Uh, Dave, like I say at the beginning, is considered an expert in these matters. And it's been great to have him in the room this morning. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, uh, spend your Saturday morning with us. There will be a link on YouTube. Uh, I will pass on my thanks to James Bolton for taking the time to do that recording. Uh, but that's it from me, Dave, unless you want to say anything particular. 43 days to Christmas. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And on that bombshell. Have you got some Christmas music to play us out on? I, I've got a little bit of music to play us out on. And on that bombshell, I will wish you a happy, relaxing weekend. And if you need any further help or advice, 
from myself, Phil Dyer, Public Image Coordinator, or Dave King, Rotary uh, Magazine Editor. Please get in touch. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. 